So, it's uh, getting later in the day. Oh. I'm happy to introduce you to Alexis Roussel, mm -hmm. Le Français. So this is an English talk, as you might observe already. Um, Alexis is going to give you a very interesting proposal, digital integrity of the human person as a new fundamental right. Alexis is totally qualified to do this because he's trained as a lawyer and in another life uh, he has been the president of the Swiss um, Pirate Party. So welcome, Alexis. Thank you. Um, and, uh, yeah, I have the... Uh I have the exception uh, to be able, uh, the, the, author, the authorization to be able to make a presentation in English. Um, my German is good for understanding, so uh, if you ask questions in German, that will be fine, but it's, uh, I feel more comfortable speaking English, so I had the uh, authorization of the, the head of the Digital Gesellschaft to do so. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about a, a concept which we, we've been working on since several years and now it's getting some traction and it's getting into a, a more active mode. So we went from thinking to now starting to implement and basically uh, uh, we're making a lot of uh, presentation like this and some work to uh, uh, get around this new, uh, new concept. So first a bit the context of why uh, I was, I was, I I pinpoint this, this uh, new digital right and why did we need these kind of things. So a bit the context, so as uh, was said in the introduction, I was president of the Pirate Party of Switzerland uh, eight years ago now, it's been some time. I'm still, uh, I'm still pirate in the heart and I'm still uh, with them. Uh, but at that time when I went into politics, what struck me was uh, the difference between the two worlds. You know, we had two uh, generation that was that was fighting each other, and uh, this one this is one of the key moments where this fight was uh, uh, seen. It's during the trial of uh, Peter Sunde in uh, in Sweden, where there's a very good documentary about it. And the judge uh, wants to connect to Peter Sunde. He wants to be young and uh, techy, so he says, "Yeah, but uh, you were meeting IRL." And then Peter Sander said, no, 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 we don't talk about, we don't like the expression IRL, which means in real life, because we say AFK, away from keyboard, because for us the internet is real. So basically he was saying to the judge, you think the internet is just something else, uh, it's like Angela Merkel Neuland, uh, but for us it's an extension of our life and our world. Eh? And, and the whole uh, debate about peer-to-peer uh, -peer at that time uh, it wasn't about copyright, it was building new public spaces where people could live. So that was uh, one a good example that struck me at that time and that pushed me, I mean, I was already in politics before that, but that, uh, that, that was one of the key things that came out. The other thing which is more negative is how uh, the Silicon Valley, but also all the governments in Europe, when they are now building, they want to be pro-tech, they are building the industry, they, they, they lay the ground of all the, all the regulations to foster this data-driven uh, industry, and they claim that data, personal data, is the oil of the 21st century, and I always felt that that was wrong, somehow it is wrong. Data is extremely powerful, like oil. oil. Yes, it is. It has full of energy. Yes, it is. But for me, I think it's more because it's about people. You know, it's not just a product. It's, it's people. So that was the, the context which uh, pushed me uh, in that direction. So I said, I'm a lawyer. I'm also looking all the development of the data protection law. And we see a lot of new legal um, rights which are appearing, so it, that's a, a, a big movement which is called the human uh, digital rights uh, movement. Uh, you see the right for um, uh, access, the right for to be forgiven, uh, uh, to, to erase data, these kind of rights that appear. But a lot of people are looking for a more core human right, something that would be an, like an umbrella uh, ar around this. So. I'm a lawyer, I'm a politician, I also love history and I'm, I'm looking how the revolutions have already been uh, done 
And in reality, when you look and when you study the, the, the traditional revolutions, and in Switzerland, even though we didn't have much blood uh, being spilled here, we were a core part of this uh, humanist revolution in the uh, 17th or 18th century. Um, but you see that there is a connection between uh, a new innovation, which is a information innovation like printing press, and then a few centuries later, it is being used to promote new rights. And again, the internet has pr produced a new way of printing data and sharing data, and um, this will be uh, a source of new uh, of rise of new rights, and we see it already happening. So then, my construction was to go try to see from the top, and when you look at the constitution, when you read the constitution or the declaration of human rights, you will see that at the top of all of it, there is one thing called the right to life. The right to life has some core, it means that every individual uh, has the right to be there, okay? And then from there, this is the most important rights because all the other rights derive from the right to life, okay? If you don't have the right to life, then you don't have any other rights. Um, it has a history, which is very long. It, it started with Christianity and Judaism, where like, you shall not kill, that, that, that's this basic concept. But it has been actually written in our constitution, written in our declaration of human rights, pretty recently, okay? uh, in, the next, in the last uh, one or two centuries. The, the right to life, to understand it, it's the right to be born, the right to be dead. There is a few rights that you have like this that come with you as a person. But it, it's also a right, a, a, a right which is extremely large. You know? We don't give much detail about it. It's for every human to have one. You know? uh, but we don't define really how you are human. Uh, if you have one leg less than the others, you are still human. Uh, so it's not about how you define human, it's more about you define there is a human, it is born, and it has a right to life. Some constitutions, and like the Swiss one for example, try to give a bit of a more detail, and uh, basically, uh, based on our, uh, on, on our culture, we said that there is a body and there's a soul. So uh, we define that there is a physical integrity of the body that should be protected, at the same time we decided that there's a mental integrity of the person that should be uh, protected. These principles are in Article 10 of the Constitution. They're very vague, but they, they are there, and all the rest of the laws, the criminal law and the civil law, derive from those rights. So every time there's interaction between the people and the state, or between individuals, or between individuals and company, uh, it has to be done in the respect of the physical and mental integrity of everyone, which is normal, because if you don't, you see abuses. Uh, some abuses, for example, like uh, are, are almost at the, at the limit, you know. Uh, advertising can be seen as a harm to your mental integrity, but still, the, so that's why there are rules about um, advertisement. So, this is the, the actual context, and if we go back to what Peter Sander said, our life has been, our space has been extended to the digital self, to the digital part, and, and we can also claim that our life have been extended to the digital uh, realm. So when you are born today, um, I was maybe still lucky to be born in a time, or lucky or not, but uh, and born in a time where uh, if you were born physically, you didn't exist electronically. But today, it's all together. Uh, when you are even conceived, your parents are talking about you, there is medical data to uh, follow up, the mo to monitor the, the, uh, the, the birth uh, of, the, of the child. And when you, when you are born, you already have a lot of extensive data, uh, not only uh, so health data, administrative data, and also just your parents sharing on the social networks the, uh, the scan of, of the belly. So, uh, so your first picture, even before you're, you are born. So the right to, and the right to life, actually, the same way, exists before you are born. So this is the abortion debate. So we see that the life, the, 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 uh, by birth, you are really digital. And when you are dying, there is a right to die. And when you are dying, uh, it, something also happens on the digital space. And this is something we are learning right now, you know, how you die on the digital space. So it goes together. and. My claim is to say that the right of life includes the digital part of ourselves. 
So the concept is very simple, is that next to your physical and mental integrity, you also have a digital integrity. It represents yourself, your digital self, and the fact that it should, if you want to be free, if you want to be um, autonomous in your own deci decision, and if you want this, what we call this um, uh, uh, self-determination uh, of, uh, of your will, um, then you need to guarantee this, auto this, this uh, integrity. Um, and if you uh, guarantee it also in digital space, then you allow people to be autonomous and free. That's a very basic thing. So, so when you go in there, there are some consequences. And um, they are the, the first consequence, and this is actually has been already pinpointed, uh, is that the personal data which makes up this digital self. It's a very blur thing. Well, we can, it's not like a body that you can th that you think you think you know what is a physical body, but it's like a blur thing about all your data which are stored everywhere, what you produce. You know, there's there's some studies also on what are the personal data and the different layers of it. So it's all of it somehow. Okay? And all of these data, they are not objects. They are elements from your digital self. They are elements from your person. So this is interesting because it was already pointed out by an association which is called uh, AFAPDP. AFAPDP is an uh, association where all the data protection uh, agencies so the Swiss EDUP uh, is, is a French-speaking association. So you have the Swiss EDUP, you have the, uh, the French CNIL, uh, the Canadian ones, Belgium ones, some African ones. Okay, so it's a, it's a bunch of, uh, it's about 30 uh, different data protection agencies. And they have declared this in 2018 that personal data is not an object that can be sold. It is, a, um, it is an element of your body, and then you have rights which are inalienable, so you cannot give them away, like your body. It compares your body to your, to, it compares your data to organs of your body. Um, for me, it, it, it also flips the coin about harvesting data. Uh, today, we consider that harvesting data is something which is admissible, uh, even if you as an individual doesn't have any relationship with the company or the, the state or the service which is harvesting data on you, uh, and this should be flipped. By default, harvesting data should not be authorized unless uh, um, consent is given, and a formal, informed consent. So, the, um, so again, like I said at the beginning, the, the space where we are living in is a unique space. It's not a parallel universe. And all the theories, all the work that is being done, thinking that it's two different worlds, uh, needs to needs to stop. So we have to think about a, a whole exchange, a whole environment of life, including the the digital side. Um, one also important thing is that it is we have to admit one thing, and uh, is that it is impossible for a human being to know where its data is people don't have any clue about the extent of their digital self. This is the case. You don't know in which databases you are. You don't know what is the impact of you clicking on some button. It creates a lot of uh, actions and data around you which you are not aware of. And even if you're a super scientist expert who knows how internet works uh, in the, uh, by heart, you won't know how much data you produce. And today, we see that many, many of the laws that we have, especially in Switzerland, the data protection law, assume that you know where your data are so you can defend them. You, you can defend yourself against someone who's um, harvesting data and manipulating you. So that should be reversed. You don't need to know where your data uh, is to be protected. And that's one of the consequences. So the... Um, is the right to digital integrity compatible with the actual laws that we have? So it's definitely, we'll take the most uh, uh, modern one, which is the GDPR, and uh, the, Swiss digital, the Swiss law is still made on, on a very ancient model. Uh, just for you to know, in the 70s, when you have the first data protection laws, the scenario that we had to face were completely different. It was the state who were starting to uh, create database 
for registers, for tax register, for civil register, whatever, and you had no digital, live digital exi existence. So the only thing was to protect you from abuse from the governments to um, harvest data in an incorrect way. Uh, now, the, the, we have changed. We're in a more active way. We are producing ourselves a lot of data. We're using a lot of services. We are exchanging. We are having experiences. We are making. Uh, we are working in, in this environment. So it's completely different, and uh, and and the, the, the laws had a bit time to adapt. So GDPR is on the way to for, for this. So it's not a compa incompatible in the sense that it will start if it if there is a overarching uh, digital integrity right then all the rights which are in the uh, GDPR, uh, they, they, they just uh, are tools and, and specific rights um, to apply, to, to be allowed to respect this digital integrity of the human person. So, but there is one point which is extremely incompatible in that, in that GDPR, is, the art, is actually the most important article. And when I first read the GDPR, I just stop at this article and I say, okay, this is bullshit. Uh, why? Uh, even though some people think all of the rest is good, because GDPR has an Article 2, which is the material scope. And the material scope, there is what is included and what is excluded. And what is excluded is actually any behavior from the state, if it concerns security from very far away, even like uh, just making some inquiries, is enough for them to... to um, to disregard any uh, rights or rules which are in the GDPR. So there is the Convention 108 from the Council of Europe, which is trying to reduce a bit that gap. But this security black hole that we call, it's a common thing. It's also like in the Pat Patriot Act in the US, you have the same kind of uh, security black hole. Basically, if it's for security, they can do whatever they want. So that we need to uh, stop. Um, so why do we need such a right? There's a few, uh, few reasons why we need to, uh, to have this right, but it basically it imposes, if we put this in the Constitution, it imposes the state to interact with the citizen uh, in a way that it doesn't harm them, okay? But also digitally. So this is the case by we force them already to respect our dignity, to respect our physical and mental integri integrity in the relationship, but they also have to... Um, uh, to respect us and to interact with the way with that is digitally safe, which tells me, for example, that if a police officer uses a stat uh, Troyan with a zero day in it, and the zero day is actually giving a setting a vulnerability or using a vulnerability which is available everywhere, he's not being safe with the, with the society. He's actually being harmful. Um, it's into, it, it has also pushed the state to give the right tools or to educate the people to use the right tools. Uh, here I'm thinking about uh, simple cryptography. There should be a right to use cryptography. It shouldn't be something bad. You shouldn't be uh, seen as a terrorist because you're, you're using cryptography. And there is, a, there is this kind of uh, uh, concept which is around, and especially like in countries like Australia, it's very trying to fight uh, cryptography and trying to put b uh, uh, backdoors in it. So here it should be the role of the state to actually make sure that the citizen have the tools to uh, protect themselves and protect their autonomy. Um, and also, and that's more general, uh, the state should be um, push, be an example in the new forms of uh, uh, any kind of new forms of threats that are happening between private uh, people, so uh, there is a, a, a big development of the digital uh, slavery right now, uh, so your data are being used to generate value and you are working, your data is working, and, and also the governments are trying to uh, f harvest this uh, value uh, uh, through big data. Uh, and. Um, and again, they should, they should be able to develop their the service. We should be able to have a society that develops where the state has services which respect and don't abuse and don't go into digital uh, slavery. So, so basically, at the end, the right to digital integrity next to the physical and um, mental integrity is just a general hat for the justification of any kind of uh, data protection uh, right which comes from this. But it changes the perspective of like actually protecting an individual and not just protecting data itself. So how do we implement this? So first I, 
identify the two most important for me implementations. Uh, the first one is in the Charter of the Fundamental Rights of the European Union, Article 3. It's very simple. Everyone has a right to respect for his physical uh, for his or her physical and mental integrity. And then there's much more achievable goal for me is the Swiss Constitution itself, where in Article 2, in the right of life, right to life, there is every person has a right to personal liberty, in particular to physical and mental integrity and, the f and to freedom of movement. So how do we change that? We just add one word. We add digi digital integrity next to both of them. So... What is interesting is that um, we were lucky or we are in a country which is great in some sense uh, because we are in a constant constitutional uh, work and um, uh, we are voting every time to change the constitution but also we have changes from, we have a federal state system where uh, cantons are changing their, are renewing their constitution from time to time. So this year it's the Valais constitution which is being completely renewed and, um, and, and the context is a, a, a bit interesting because it's, uh, it's the third, so, so there was the, the Geneva Constitution two years ago, and uh, there was uh, uh, another uh, Fribourg, or another, it was mostly French sp uh, speaking side constitutions that were done in the year of the internet. Huh? Uh, and here, um, uh, they took the chance to put uh, some of uh, the new rights which were appearing. And uh, the Committee on Fundamental Rights, so the one who's writing this paragraph on fundamental rights, has took this uh, proposal, and they didn't put it exactly like with the three uh, notions together. They made two uh, uh, in the same article. They make two alineas. So the first one is every human person has the right to physical and mental integrity. And they propose a second line with every human person has the right to his digital integrity. So this is going to be proposed in the plenum of the uh, Valis um, constitution uh, in April of this year. And hopefully uh, it was approved anonymously by the committee and hopefully will be approved by the plenum. Um, and what they, what's interesting for them is that they, they really took it as a, as a generous justification. You know? they, they had this discussion with what do we put inside. They put some elements in there, and, uh, but basically they, they, they liked the idea that it was giving a, a protective vision uh, that was interesting. So uh, there's been a bunch of uh, uh, presentation that we did, uh, two uh, achievements which were interesting. Um, because we've been working silently in this. Uh, in the SWICO 2019 um, Digitalisierungsmonitor, that was a, 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 an interview. On a, these were questions that the national uh, candidates had to uh, answer. And actually, I had the chance to, uh, to add questions in there. So I did just add this question, if you look it up, question 13, that was, do you think there is a right to uh, physical, uh, digital integrity that should be added in the, in the Constitution? And the, the, the result, uh, I only saw them a few months later because I had forgotten about it. Basically, the green says 99% yes, and the worst were the SVP, 55% yes. Uh, also, the uh, Socialist uh, Party had created a very good paper in 2015 that actually no one is, people actually forgot about it. Maybe some of you here uh, participated a little bit in this, but this is a, a very interesting paper and they, uh, I had the chance also to propose them and they added, uh, so since 2015 actually, they have the right to digital integrity. Uh, linked to the um, Informationale Selbstbestimmung, which uh, they, say, they say it goes together, and it does. They explain the relationship between the two, and they, they have it there. They don't use it because they don't, actually, they don't use the whole paper. <laughs> but anyway, it's there. Uh, future work, so we're moving uh, forward uh, with the Green uh, and the Pirates, the pirates uh, MEPs in, in, uh, in Brussels. Um, uh, some, oh yeah, and, and I forgot one point, very important here. Uh, yesterday, 
that was yeah, yeah yesterday in Neuchâtel, so I'm in Neuchâtel right now, but the University of Law in Neuchâtel made the first legal uh, event on the topic, so I was pre presenting a general topic. The person from the Valis conference came also to present uh, very deep, so the presentation are available online. And then all the teacher, a constitutional law teacher, criminal law, civil law, uh, they all um, made arguments uh, for, against it, and it was really interesting. Um, so it started to, uh, to create a doctrine uh, around our, um, this. Um, what we want to do also is um, publish, uh, publish an essay, do some legal research, and hopefully at one point launch either cantonal and federal initiative on this. So yeah, at the end, what can we do to support? If you want to support at one point, if you think it's a good idea, building tools that protect privacy and use it, um, ask the judge in the lawsuits, and I will try to see also if some of the lawsuits in Switzerland and Germany, um, we can ask, okay, this particular scenario where there was an abuse of data, if we just ask the question and we create jurisprudence on it, uh, does it harm my digital integrity? Uh, basically, these are things we can do. Uh, we have one small website, there's a bug on it, but you can still reach it. It's mostly in French, and there's a little bit of data uh, here to follow up. Thank you very much. I think we have a couple of seconds for uh, questions. Over the post. Exactly. Yeah, we have ten minutes for questions. Uh, five minutes for questions here, yeah. and now we'll come to you with the oh, microphone. Five minutes. Uh, thank you for your talk. First of all, I think it's very uh, a very interesting concept, and also needed very much. Um, but you mentioned one of the biggest challenges, um, which is that you don't know where your data actually is, right? Mm. You talked about defending your data yeah. and um, also about digital slavery. Because um, you said um, you want the states to enable the people to defend their data mm -hmm. and uh, fight digital slavery. How, you know, what are some uh, some concrete uh, measures you would propose to do that, or how, how can we um, solve that problem that we don't know where the data actually is? So, uh, one, first, uh, what, one first important thing, these are very general principles, okay? It's not going to solve anything in the next day, it's just a, a broad thing and that might, in, with all the work we do in all the different things, uh, maybe uh, uh, in 30 or 20 years we got something which is more uh, logical based on this. Huh? It's a very long, it's a very long work which is being done. Uh, so one example, for example, would be for the state in every uh, place, is very uh, locally or whatever. Depending on the service that the state is providing, they should only uh, have the data that is necessary to provide that service. They don't need something else. So, for example, you could, ima you could imagine uh, services where um, if the only data that is need to be known is the, um, uh, is the address and not the name, then they should not collect the name. So, to have this, pr to have this uh, um, uh, way of thinking of saying, the less we collect data to provide a specific server, the better it is, you know? This is already because it, it, it lowers down the pressure and, and, and it lowers down your responsibility of keeping all this data safe. Uh, then, of course, we can use uh, cryptography with this, you know, because there's a lot of things and it's, today it's a, a bit underrated, uh, not used much, is all the, uh, the proof system in cryptography uh, using zero knowledge proof. That will come, it will be very essential of being able to certify things without sharing personal data. So these are the kind of uh, technology that the state should be promoting uh, using, yeah, uh, trying to, to be an example by not collecting data. So my wish is that I can have a public service where they don't know my name, but it's okay. They have the guarantee of who I am and what I, what I need and the, if I paid, uh, but they don't know my name. Uh, you mentioned your interest in history, and um, you also said uh, there was a lot of uh, blood which was spoiled for human rights to mm -hmm. put forward. So uh, you didn't talk about uh, the dark side, the enemies of your proposal. Who is standing up against it? 
uh, what do you expect? Because I guess in the principle, all the people will say yes, but who will fight it? Yeah. So, so it's interesting because the, the um, last week I was in Munich, there was this uh, conf uh, security conference and there was one side event, which is the Pirate se se Security Conference. And there we have Mikulash, which is a, uh, uh, our, one of our MEPs from Czech Republic. And he uh, was starting to present his view of the world through his side, through his point of view, which um, he claimed there is a new iron curtain which is being built between countries which are protective of digital human of human digital rights and uh, state surveillance uh, uh, world, and uh, and hopefully we don't have this iron curtain in our own countries. Huh? Uh, but he sees that he sees that happening. So definitely there will be some like very geopolitical games, um, and uh, definitely the Silicon Valley will be more inclined to uh, treat data as a property that you can buy and sell, so that would be one of the opponents. Um, and uh, then uh, we also saw some, some people who claim that data, personal data, should be common good and not, not owned by the people, but just owned by the society. So the society can do whatever they want with the data, but not the individuals. Uh, so there's a few things. In Switzerland, if, you go, if we go deeper here, um, I think that our culture is inclined towards this, or so most people would be would agree with this. Uh, even uh, at the government level, um, at the end, people would agree, and uh, it would be hard to sometimes assume some of the consequences, uh, like the right to use cryptography and the right to develop anonymity tools. Uh, that's a bit hard for people <laughs> uh, to, to claim. Uh, I would see that the, the fight would come from companies who are data-driven companies. So uh, the most well-known example that I try to fight a bit, but the law is not on my side, it's on their side right now, is companies like Moneyhouse. Uh, they, uh, they, they're they just hoarding data and, 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 and making value out of it. Okay, So that would be uh, one kind of the economy which would be the fighting this. And then the, the rest is, uh, is, uh, is the fights I see are generational, it's a generational gap. That people who are still like uh, the senior people today were not born digitally. So they cannot understand the digital life the same way as, as, as we do today. Um, I was lucky. I was, I was pushed into you know, when, I, when I was four years old and I was really into a, a space where I, can, I could understand that from the beginning. But even me, I don't have the same understanding as my child today who is um, 10 years old and he has friend he never know. He's on his Discord channel and he has a, on his Discord channel his friends from school plus some friends from somewhere else he never met. So he has a, uh, a, an environment which, which is completely mixed. For him it will be no problem, it will be normal. So time will make us win anyway. Okay, so unfortunately, time is over uh, for Q&A. Uh, you have to ask uh, Alexis himself personally, and he will be happy to uh, answer your questions, I guess. Um, yeah, please give a warm applause to Alexis Russo.